there are three general types of ways you can organize a business. The first is the most simple and is generally only appropriate for very small businesses, and that's a sole proprietorship, where you have a single owner. And so the business we have so far is a sole proprietorship. So Smith owns the business, owns all the stock, and so on. But that would be where you have a single owner. And then you can have a partnership, which was the second type of uh, organization you can have. And there you have multiple owners who all act as joint owners or co-owners. And then the last, more modern form of organization is a corporation where you have a stock issue and whoever owns the stock owns part of the corporation. We're going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of each of these forms of organization. The corporate form of organization is the most commonly used, and the reason is that it is a limited liability organization. So if you're a sole proprietorship or a straight partnership, each of the partners or the owner of the business has a legal liability for whatever the business does. So they have direct liability, whereas if you have a corporate form of ownership, the shareholders or the owners have no legal liability. The most that they can lose is whatever they pay for their shares. And so this protects the owners and protects the shareholders from lawsuits or other other uh, things. So limited liability is the most important advantage. Uh, easy to transfer ownership because there you have shares of stock. They may be publicly traded or traded in some other form. Uh, let's you raise capital from lots more investors because it's harder to get investors to come into a partnership or with you as a sole proprietorship. But if you have shares, you can raise capital. The people that buy shares know that there will probably be a public market for these shares. So if they decide they don't want to own the shares, there's a place for them to sell those shares. Um, and the corporation has a um, infinite existence. So a corporation never dies, only if it is gone into bankruptcy or bought by another corporation does it disappear. Where if you have a sole proprietorship or partnership, the partners die, or the sole proprietor dies, the business dies with them. Um, a certain amount of prestige, possibly, to being a corporation versus not a corporate entity. Some of the disadvantages of corporate ownership are, in some cases, the tax laws don't favor corporations. In some cases, governments impose a second level of taxation on dividends from corporations first level of taxation on the profits of the corporation and the second on the dividend. Uh, also a regulatory burden. So if your company is a public corporation, then you have all sorts of disclosure requirements. You have to show and a report your 10K forms. Um, so you can have you know, a lot of reporting and regulatory burden. Uh, other disadvantage of a public corporation is that a lot of your private information gets disclosed. And so that's why many corporations choose to be private corporations where there's no trading, no ownership of the company by the public, just by a you know, small group of insiders. And that way, very little reporting has to be done. Since they're a private corporation with no outside investors, then they don't have to disclose any information. So that's... Uh, what has favored the uh, creation of lots of private companies, like private equity or private companies, especially in the U.S. Yes. Who's the what? Um, the uh, Commerce Department, but really there is no regulator in terms of their, not in the same sense that a public corporation has a regulator, it requires the corporation to disclose financial information, report events you know, in a timely way. A private company, the idea is that whoever is invested there 
they're insiders or they know what's going on and they don't need a regulator to uh, make sure that they're aware of what is going on. So I would say the, the only uh, regulatory enforcement would be legal action. So if you're in a private company, you can't go to the SEC, you have to go to a, a lawyer or a court and say, oh, you know, something bad is happening. Uh, no law, there are laws regulating private companies, but not requiring them to disclose financials or any other information. You know, if they want to borrow money, then they'll have to disclose that information to their lender, but they don't have to disclose it to the public. And so, as I said, that's considered an advantage if you have a newer business or a tech business where you don't want to disclose any of your information except to insiders. Lenders. Uh, so, proprietorships and partnerships, uh, in this case, the owner's equity would be labeled capital, uh, and the owner's equities are reported in a capital account. Uh, corporation, owner's equity is stockholder's equity or shareholder's equity, and there are two parts to shareholder's equity in most uh, firms. One is a par value on that equity, the other is that paid in capital. And remember in the early example, we just had paid in capital. So par value is something you still see, and it will be on the uh, statement of owner's equity for Starbucks. And what it is, it's a historical artifact. So in the early days of corporations and shares being created, the regulators at that time wanted to make sure that the people who created corporations just couldn't print millions of shares and sell them to everybody. So they required that each share have at least a certain amount of par value that would be retained in the company. And so in the old days, par value could be five dollars, a dollar, or something significant, and it actually meant that that money would have to stay in the company legally, and then if the company went bankrupt, shareholders could still have some money. It would also limit, in terms of the amount of money that insiders could take out of the company, so if you issued shares, some of the money had to stay in the company. You couldn't just take it out yourself, and you know, so on. Uh, nowadays, our value is usually one hundredth of one penny, one twentieth of a penny, it's an insignificant amount of money. But the law is still there, so legally you still have to have a par value, and legally you have to account for all those pennies on your account. But you know, economically, this is not a significant, uh, not economically significant, it's just something that's fair. We'll, we'll look at some examples uh, a little bit later. The paid in capital, that is important because that's the original money that was paid to the shares when they were issued. That is when you have an IPO or whatever, however much public shareholders put in in capital, that's what paid in capital. Questions about that? Um, so, par value is something printed on a stock certificate, so that will be there, legally required by different states. Paid in capital is excess of par value, so the difference between what is paid shares and there's par value. You see there's par value plus paid in capital to equal the total capital that was originally provided. These two things. And common stock, when you look at this in the financial statements, it's listed as par value. So it'll be a tiny, tiny number. It's a very, very small thing because as I said, I think with Starbucks the par value is one twentieth of one penny yeah. Very good. So, uh, shareholders have a residual claim on the corporation, so this means that they receive all of the money, the benefit, profitability, gains of the company once the liabilities have been paid. That's the debt holders or preferred shares, if you have that, have been paid to their residual owner. And if the company gets to a position where the value of the assets are worth less than the liabilities. 
what happens. So if you have a company that is effectively going into bankruptcy or financial distress because their liabilities are worth more than the assets of the firm, so what happens to the shareholders in that situation? Yeah, so they will be eliminated usually depending on the legal system of the court and then the Debt holders or the creditors, they'll become the new shareholders. So, um, now, the shareholders do not govern the company directly. So, shareholders don't you know, just get together and decide everything that the company is trying to do. The shareholders elect the board of directors who are their legal representatives. And the board of directors are supposed to manage the company and Truth management, direct management, set policy. Uh, members of boards, we usually CEOs or you know, fairly successful people, can also be people with a particular expertise, like attorneys or uh, professors, sometimes doctors, if you're in the medical business. Uh, sometimes the chairman of the board is also the chief executive officer. And that's fairly common in the US. Not always true. You know, so, a good example is uh, Boeing, a big aircraft manufacturer, just yesterday announced that their chairman of the board, who was also the CEO, was no longer the chairman of the board. So, they were taking away that title, and he was just the CEO because Boeing has had a lot of problems with its 737 MAX jet. And pretty much they're saying to him, All right, we're taking this away now. If you don't solve this problem pretty quickly, you're not going to be the CEO anymore either. So it's like punishing them. And so if the manager does very well, then the reward might be to the CEO and the chairman of the board, which gives you some power over the board. Um, also, regulatory requirements require that you have a minimum number of outside or independent directors. So you'll have insiders who are managers of the company, the CEO, CFO, you know, depends. But legally, you often have to have a certain number of independent. And this is you know, why. Why do we need independent directors? What? Um, another perspective, yes. So they are not working for the company themselves, so they have an outside perspective or expertise. Absolutely, they, they are a check or a balance against the people that work for the company who are also on the board. You know? And so, at the very minimum, you need independent directors to be on the compensation committee and decide how much the management of the company, who are also board members, are going to be paid. So, you need that, that independence. Although, the reality is that a lot of times the uh, CEO has so much influence that they you know, end up sort of choosing the independent directors, people who are their friends, or like in the case of Elon Musk and Tesla, he had his uh, cousins on the board, he had his, uh, his brother on the board too. You know, so sometimes it can be quite uh, not so independent. But anyway, generally, yeah. Yeah, so it is to, to avoid that, but you know, the thing is with many boards, there's lots of conflicts of interest. But even if you pick independent directors, they may be people who do business with the company. So a lot of times it might be some of your main customers or someone who uh, depends on your company to manage the company's uh, investments or things like that. And so uh, sometimes the independent ones aren't so independent. Because essentially the management wants to control the board. Because the management wants to control its compensation, wants to make sure the board is friendly, and if something bad happens, they're not going to fire them. So it, it's a balance. And it really depends on who the shareholders are. So if the shareholders are lots of little shareholders, you know, small stakes, they generally uh, cannot force a more independent board. But if the shareholders are big shareholders or activist investors, they generally force 
board to take independent or outside directors. You know, because they can actually, they have enough votes that they can make a change. Okay. Other questions? All right. So, board standing is to ensure that the managers act in the best interest of the shareholders. And they do this by monitoring the management. And this is what makes the corporate form effective as long as the board is doing its job. Unfortunately, we have lots of instances where board of directors are there, you know, and they're there just for one day a month or something, and they really, some of them don't, you know, really work that hard. You know, so you can have problems like that. But ideally, the board should be actively managing the management monitoring their performance. So the stockholders elect the board of directors, elect the manager. Now effectively, <coughs> it's very difficult for stockholders to remove directors or choose their own directors, because usually there'll be uh, directors that are proposed by the management and by the existing board, and generally stockholders cannot change board of directors very easily because the main stockholders in many businesses, they may be like small shareholders, and the big shareholders are usually institutions, you know, like a fund or whatever that owns a lot of 